that is of substance is that we have our annual church picnic planned for October the 20th. On Saturday, we start approximately noon. Some people get out there earlier, help to get things set up, get grills set up, all of that kind of thing. Who can bring gr grills? Who's got pickup trucks that can help haul some things out there? Sign-up sheets are out in the fellowship hall, so take a look at that. The location, we'll be putting maps up and everything like that, but for people who are uh, already thinking about it, the address is 21 27 Hartwell, one word, Hartwell, in Patterson, Texas. So that will, um, you can just punch that into your GPS and that'll get you there in, uh, in plenty of time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so we can each make sure that we are spiritually prepared to come into the presence of the Lord. We are to be in a position of sanctification, a word that means that we are in a place where we are usable by God, set apart for his service. And that's the key idea for all these terms such as uh, sanctification or sanctuary or holy. And those are terms that will become more important to us, more significant to us, as we as we go forward but to understand that so when we are sanctified that doesn't mean we're uh, like some innocent choir boy it means that we are just in a position to be used by the Lord walking by the Spirit uh, set aside to his service because we have done what is necessary to be a cleansed of sin which means to confess to admit or acknowledge our sin to God and instantly we're cleansed, we're forgiven of those sins and cleansed of all unrighteousness. That restores us to a place where we can be experientially sanctified. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and in a few moments I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, Scripture tells us that you have said to us, Be holy, for I am holy. That emphasizes the importance of sanctification, being set apart to your service. And this is why we take the time to confess sin, to focus on uh, how we have rebelled against you and how we have gone our own way, how we have distorted the truth, and how we have let our own fallen nature dictate to our souls what we should do. And you have, for, have forgiven us because of Christ's work on the cross, because of his de death, because the certificate of our debt was nailed to the cross in 33 AD. Now, Father, we pray that we might not take this lightly. But as we are to be sanctified, that we may walk with you, we are to be filled by the Spirit, and we are to abide in your word. And so we pray that as we study your word, that not only will we abide in you, in your word, but your word will abide in us, and that we may come to an ever greater appreciation of all that you are and all that you have done for us. In Christ's name, amen. 
as we continue our study on on worship part of worship is prayer we've seen a few prayers and talked a little bit about intercession uh, over the last few weeks we ta- saw how Abraham interceded uh, for Lot and his family, how he interceded at other times for the uh, Philistine king. And so intercession is our prayer for others. And uh, I thought I would read some sections here from a prayer of intercession from the uh, prayer book that I have been reading from, the private devotions of Lancelot Andrews. And as I said before, he is one of the chief translators of the King James Version. And so as we've been reading through First uh, and Second Samuel, he translated that into King James. A lot, so much of what we read, the language, the uh, meter, the rhythm of First and Second Samuel uh, is due to his uh, great scholarship. This is a prayer of intercession. It's interesting how this is broken down. It will this a chapter. You know, these were not written to be read to anybody. They're just his private prayers that he wrote to focus his thinking on God. I know that there are those of you who have done this and maybe written hymns because I have been sent copies, and that's a great exercise for people to do because it focuses your attention on the subject at hand, which is your prayer and your praise for God. And these prayers, uh, this is called the second form of morning prayer, and there are about five sections to it, and it covers about ten pages of really fine print that I have to almost get a magnifying glass out to read. So I'm just going to read part of this prayer of intercession. For the Catholic Church, now he doesn't mean Roman Catholic, This is not long after the Reformation. He's using it in its original intent of the universal church, the body of Christ. For the Catholic Church, for the churches throughout the world, their truth, unity, notice he puts truth first. That's very biblical. For their truth, unity and stability to wit, in all let charity thrive, truth live. For our own church, that the things that are wanting therein be supplied, that are not right, be set in order, that all heresies, schisms, scandals, as well public as private, be put out of the way, correct the erring, convert the unbelieving, increase the faith of thy church, destroy heresies, crush violent enemies. For the clergy, that they rightly divide, that they walk upright, that while teaching others themselves may learn for all the people, that they think not of themselves more highly than they ought, but be persuaded by reason and yield to the authority of superiors for commonwealths, their stability and peace, for the kingdom, municipality, our city, that they speed well and happily and be delivered from all peril and inconvenience. And by speeding well, he doesn't mean speeding down the highway, okay? That is a term for how one lives in the Elizabethan English. For the king, help him now, O Lord. Defend him with truth and favorable kindness as with a shield. Speak comfortably good things unto him, on behalf of the church and thy people. For the prudence of counselors, equity, integrity of judges, courage of the army, temperance of the people. For the rising generation, whether in universities or in schools, that as in age, so they may increase with all, both in wisdom and favor with God and men. For them that make themselves beneficent, beneficent toward things sacred. Reward thou them sevenfold into their bosom. Let their souls dwell at ease, and their seed inherit the land. Let them be blessed that consider the poor, that it may please thee to reward all our benefactors with eternal good things. For the benefits which they have bestowed upon us on earth, 
Let them win eternal rewards in heaven. That thou vouchsafe to look upon and to relieve the miseries of the poor and captives. That it may please thee to remember with benign compassion the frail lapses of the flesh and to support the falling that it may please thee to hold accepted the reasonable service of our obedience, that it may please thee to raise up our minds to heavenly desires, that it may please thee to turn back upon us the eyes of mercy, that it may please thee to deliver the souls of us and of our kinfolk from eternal damnation, that together with them for whom I have prayed, or for who I am in any sort bound to pray, and with all the people of God, it be granted me to be brought into thy kingdom, there to appear in righteousness and to be satisfied with glory. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. Lot of good ideas and verbiage in there to include in our, in our prayers. We've gotten such a trend toward informality and um, and colloquialism in our language and even in our prayer. And when we think about the scripture, even though we look at the Greek and we call it the Koine Greek, there were not too many common people who were talking about the words like hilaskerion, the propitiation, the mercy seat. Not too many were talking about dikaiosune, righteousness. Not too many were talking about these virtues that are included in the Christian life and the words that the Apostle Paul uh, uses. It's in the everyday language of people, but it's an elevated language. The same is true of the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Uh, It's an elevated language. It is a language that all of the people spoke, but it was elevated. It's just like in the time of uh, Elizabeth and King James, when Elizabethan English is spoken, and we read uh, the language as it's coming together in Shakespeare at the same time that the King James Bible is being translated we can see that the people, we know that people didn't talk like that on the street. They understood it. It was clearly understandable everyday language, but Shakespeare's elevated language, the Bible is elevated language. When the Bible is translated into elevated language, it is to honor the God who is being revealed in the scripture. It is to recognize a principle that we're seeing again and again as we go through worship is when we come to worship God, it is a time that is holy. What's holiness mean? It's not some mystical, magical thing. See, so often within our tradition, you've heard people sort of denigrate the idea, for example, of calling an auditorium a sanctuary. Well, it's not a pure place. It's not a mystical place, but that's not what sanctuary means. Sanctuary just comes from the uh, Greek words from the root of kadosh and hagias in the New Testament. It refers to a place that is set apart for something distinct and unique, and that is the worship of the Creator God. It is not setting it aside as some kind of of otherworldly location or some place where, uh, where you are not, um, where where things. Are, it's not setting it apart as something m- m- sort of mystical and elevated in that sense, but recognizing that its purpose is distinct in focusing our attention upon God. Thus, what goes on in church. What goes on in Bible class, what goes on when we worship God, is to have something different about it that is not like everything else in life. That's what we see all the way through scriptures, and we'll see an example of that as we get into into the Word uh, tonight. Now, one of the things that we have seen as we've walked our way through Genesis, and now we're going to start in Exodus, 
one of the things that we have observed is that worship began in a sanctuary. It began in the Garden of Eden, a place that was distinct of all the earth. It was set apart for that place where man dwelt and where God met with him. Sin corrupted that situation, and so that man is excluded from that sanctuary. But God has a remedy for what sin has corrupted, and it's through sacrifice. And we see the development of sacrifice as, it, as we go through the, uh, the Old Testament. We see that worship can be perverted by ignorance. That's one of the points that, that was brought out. We see that worship also is defined by God not by man, that it is based on certain actions taking place that are the response to God's direction and God's commandment. It is not man saying, oh, I want to feel good about my relationship to God, so isn't it a good idea that I kill an animal? It doesn't come from man up. It is God who is saying, There is a blot on our relationship that is so severe that it brings death into into the world and to emphasize the horror of that death and the fact that a death must occur in order to cover the sin, we're going to institute animal sacrifice. And so we go through that Old Testament. We get to Abraham, and we realize that uh, more fully something that started at the end of Genesis chapter 3 with the, or excuse me, Genesis chapter uh, 4, at the time of Enosh, that at that time men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, we saw that God in Exodus chapter 24 call and 25 calls upon the name of the Lord. He is speaking about himself, and what he does in context is to talk about his attributes, his character, who he is as a God of forgiveness and a God of loving kindness. So that worship now not only involves sacrifice, it uh, involves the proclamation of who God is and what he is doing. Then last In the last couple of lessons, we looked at what happened in Genesis 14. Worship involves giving. There is a a giving to God, uh, and sometimes this too is sacrificial. And so giving is brought into the scenario. And we saw the last illustration of that uh, last time when God appears to to, uh, Jacob and reconfirmed the covenant And as a response, because worship is always a response to revelation, that's what we have seen, is that Jacob set up a a rock called a standing stone, that's how we refer to these now, a pillar to represent that something had happened there, that God had appeared to him there, thus making that holy ground. It wasn't holy ground because there was something special about that dirt. That dirt was the same all around, except right there, that's where this theophany had occurred and a reconfirmation of the covenant. And so he sets up this standing stone as a representative of the staircase that was in his dream of God, of the angels ascending and descending, and God making this promise. And then he gives a gift of the only thing he has of value with him, and that is oil that he poured on the top of that standing stone as his as his sacrifice and as his free will offering to God for the blessing that God has, uh, has promised him. And so that's where we ended last time. And so now what I want to do tonight is go into the next book of the Old Testament, the second book of the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus. We'll go there, and I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to see what happens when uh, Moses is confronted with, um, is confronted with God as the burning bush, okay? And what we're focusing on here is that God is the one that we learn about here, we learn a new aspect of his character, that he is the one who intervenes and the one who acts. So turn to uh, Exodus chapter 3. Now here's the circumstances. It's been about 400 years, over 400 years, since 
Jacob brought approximately 70 people with him from the promised land during a time of great famine down to a place that God had providentially worked to secure for the safety and perpetuation and preservation of the Jewish people in Egypt. And they came down while Joseph was the second highest authority in the land. The only authority above him was, was the Pharaoh. And so during this time of famine, he brings his family and all of those associated with him uh, into Egypt. And for f- over 400 years, they've lived there. But a Pharaoh arose who had no gratitude for what Joseph had done, we're told in Exodus chapter uh, 1. And so this, they turned the Israelites into slaves. And so now for a pro- probably 300 years or maybe 350 years, they had been enslaved by the Egyptians who had isolated them into an area of Goshen, but they were in slavery. And then all through this time, we learn that they have been uh, praying to God. We don't know anything else about their worship We know that they were, because they were praying to God and crying out to the Lord to deliver them, that they were continuing the tradition of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so at the end of chapter 2, we read, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, And the cry came up to God because of the bondage. So they're praying. Not unlike any of us in this room who have gone through adversity. We have faced hard times. We faced maybe it's disease, maybe it's finances, maybe it is uh, the death or loss of a loved one. Uh, There are innumerable causes of grief in our lives, and we too have cried out to God. And so they cry out to God from their misery, and God hears. He listens, and he is going to act, but on his timetable, because there are lessons to be learned here. And in Exodus 2.24, we're told that God is, we add to this, we've seen that God is a living God. We've seen that God is a God who appears. He is a God who speaks. And here we see that God is a God who hears our prayers, who listens. And then we have a an anthropomor- uh, anthropomorphism here, God remembered. God didn't forget. But from a human perspective, it's if you haven't done something that you thought sh- that people thought should have been done already, they think, well, you forgot. And so it's just a figure of speech for now God has determined that he is going to enact his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, I want you to notice this. This is kind of fun. This has been a fun day for me. I've spent almost all day studying and discovered a lot of stuff late in the afternoon, so we're going to try to pull all this together. But this is important to understand what's going to happen. When we get down to 314, you have this scene that we're all familiar with, we've all talked about, and you've heard it taught many, many times, and from me and from others, and I don't think we did a good job with it, and we're going to correct some thinking tonight. But, and that is this situation when Moses says, well, when I go to the Jews and tell them that, that you sent me, who am I going to say sent me? And then God tells them, and the way it is translated in the English, tell them that I am sent you. I am who I am. And he's telling Moses this. He's speaking to Moses about that. And so we have to understand what this name of God means, this name that is pronounced Yahweh, that's the sacred tetragrammaton or the sacred four letters, uh, Y-H-W-H. What in the world does that mean? And so one of the things that's important in discerning word meanings is context. And one of the first clues to the context that's happening here is this verse 24, God remembering his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. It is indicating that God is going to act and intervene in history. 
how that's important. We'll come back to that thought. And so we go into chapter 3, and we're told a little bit about Moses. Now, 40 years he spent as a prince of Egypt, and then uh, he kills, he re- learns that he's a Jew. He sees an Egyptian taskmaster just uh, whipping up on a Jew, and he kills him. And so then he has to flee because he's exposed as a Jew, and he's, the Egyptians despise the Jews. And so he flees to Midian, where he meets his wife. He goes to work as an under-shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro. And that's where we meet him in verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So he's a Gentile priest. That's, that's in the background here, just to remember. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So this is somewhere on the Sinai Peninsula. And then in verse 2 we read, And the angel of Yahweh. So this is the second person of the Trinity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And so as he looks at this fiery bush, he decides that he needs to investigate this and decide what is going on here, that it is not burning. And in verse 3, he says, I'll turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush doesn't burn. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, said, Moses, Moses. Now that probably rattled Moses because the voice of God is self-authenticating. And he knew in his bones, just as Romans 1.18 teaches and following teaches that every one of us knows the existence of God, Moses knew that was God's voice. And so he responds, here am I. And then God says to him, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, it's holy because God is there. That dirt in Sinai wasn't any more special than any other of the dirt five feet away. But that dirt right there had been sanctified or set apart by the presence of God. And therefore, it had to be treated with respect. It had to be treated with honor because this was where God was present. And so this is important for us to understand that when we are worshiping a holy God, that there is something about our comportment. There's something about our preparation. There is something about our mental attitude that should be distinct. When we are going to church on Sunday morning, when we are going to have corporate worship, it's not something we start thinking about as we turn off of I-10 onto the Beltway or as we see Aunt Pookie's barbecue appear on the horizon. It should be something we begin to think about from the very beginning because we are doing something distinctive on that Sunday morning. We are worshiping a holy God, the unique creator God of the universe. And because of that, our time of worship is always holy. It is set apart to the study of God and to the focus of God and to hopefully the obedience of God. We shouldn't treat it like any other time. The things that we do during that time should not be like things we do at other times. It is a distinctive time of worship. And so we see that God then identifies himself to, Mo- to Moses. He says, I am the God of your father. By that he doesn't mean his immediate father, but of the patriarchs, of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it, starting in this point, we see that as the emphasis. Again and again, you're going to see God refer to himself in this way, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That what, that's what makes a Jew a Jew. That's the line of the covenant. God made the covenant with Abraham. He confirmed it with Isaac, and he reconfirmed it 
with with Jacob and all of the Jews descend from the 12 sons of Jacob. So this is the line. And he identifies himself by doing this as the covenant God. And what does Moses do? Oh, it's so wonderful to see Jesus. It's so wonderful to see God. That's how the silly little choruses today are. Oh, I want to see Jesus. He hides his face because he is coming face to face with God as Jacob did at Peniel. He's, Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And so this would have involved Moses falling down on his face. He would have taken a posture not unlike that of anyone coming into the presence of any ancient Near Eastern king. It's a position that expresses obedience and submission to authority. That's part of how we get our word for worship in both Hebrew and Greek relate to taking this posture of kneeling. And so he would go down on his knees and he would fall down on his face with his forehead to the ground and probably with his arms outstretched. The point is, to the creator of the universe, we are nothing better than the dust from which we have come. That which makes us better is the image of God. And so, again, we recognize we cannot treat God in, an, in a familiar, trivial, or common way. And so, the Lord then says to him that he's heard the prayers. He is going to answer the prayers. So, what we saw at the end of, um, of chapter 2 is that God heard their groaning, and he remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we see that he states that he has seen this, he's heard their cry, that he's, he's heard their prayers, and he knows and understands their sorrows. And he says in verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of, Egypt, of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And what he is saying is, I've come to fulfill the promise I've made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fulfill my word to them. And then... We read in verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression of the Philistines before them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So now there's the commission. You are going to be the deliverer that they have been looking for and they have been praying for. Well, if you skip down a couple of verses... You see the statement uh, after Moses is asking this question, he co starts coming up with all the objections, and he's saying, well, who am I? I'm a nobody. Why are you using me? And God says something to him. He says, so he said, I will certainly be with you. Does that sound familiar? That's not, as I pointed out last week, that's not just omnipresence. This goes back to the same kind of statement that God made to Jacob. I will be with you. And it is a statement of covenant promise that I am going to fulfill the promise I've made to you, and I'm going to be with you in a special sense of power and protection to accomplish that which I have intended. And we trace this through last time through the Old Testament, leading up to the statement that Jesus made to the disciples uh, in the Great Commission, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is part of God's promise in his relationship now to the Jewish people. He says, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on the mountain. Notice they're going to, what? Serve God. That se that's foreshadowing. It's talking about serving God. That's the role of a priest. We saw that word abad, to work, back in Genesis 2. God put Adam in the garden 
to guard and to serve, or usually it's translated to work and to tend, but it has to do with serving God. And he says, this will be a sign when I send you, um, it will serve God on this mountain. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, this is a second objection, he says, uh, when I say the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? Okay, now this is where it starts getting really interesting because what we understand here is that, that they already knew who this God was. They already knew uh, who, he, um, who he was. They knew his name. When uh, Eve gets pregnant in Genesis 4.1, she calls her firstborn Cain because Yahweh has given me a son. Okay? So the name, the name Yahweh has been known since the fall and before the fall. And you see it all the way through. Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And we see others uh, following several times Abraham called on the name of Yahweh. So this isn't something new in terms of the name, but what is coming out that is new is something that is uh, distinct about what that name means, what it, what it indicates. And so they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And then God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, that is God, then you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So he's saying the first part to Moses. He says, I, th- I'm going to tell you who I am. I am who I am, except that's not a good translation. I want to point out a couple of things about this. What does this name Yahweh mean? And it is translated this way in not only in the New King James, King James, which I have up on top, but the bottom one is a rather recent translation called the NET Bible, uh, which was produced by the Old Testament, mostly the Old Testament Department of Dallas Seminary. I don't know who translated Exodus, but they translated that same way. I am that I am. And he said, you must say this to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So this introduces this idea. It's picked up again in Exodus 6, 2, and 3, where it repeats this. God spoke to Moses again and uh, says, I am Yahweh. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. And one uh, commentator uh, paraphrases it or translates it this way, which I think explains it a lot. It says, and God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I showed myself to Abraham. Remember, he's the God who appears. I showed myself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob in the character of El Shaddai, but in the character expressed by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what this means, what the name of God actually describes and what it relates to. And I was digging around today, and one of the books that I've been looking at as I've been going through this worship series is a book by Timothy Pierce, who teaches in the Old Testament department at Southwestern Baptist Seminary called Enthroned on Our Praise, an Old Testament theology of worship. Uh, it's not bad. I wouldn't run out and get it, but it's, it's not bad. He brings out some good points. And one of the things he po- brings up here is that most people interpret the phrase along the lines of God's actions. Rendering God's response is either I will be who I will be or I am who I will be. Now, do you notice a difference with, with, what, with what he said and this, I am who I am? And that's what you've heard most of the time, and that's what I've heard most of the time. But he points out that a vast number of people do not trans- understand it or translate it that way. And so that's just to clue you in that, that I'm not just uh, pulling this out of the hat. And he says, others attempt to understand the meaning along the lines of the traditional rendering, I am that I am. 
In this perspective, the meaning is usually related to God's self-determination and complete freedom. It's also usually related to the fact that God, saying God is always in existence. He's eternal. And that's, that's brought into the idea here. That is a common position. It was a common position. Maimonides, who was uh, probably the foremost medieval Jewish philosopher and commentator on Aristotle, uh, believed that. And it came over into Christian philosophy a lot because of this influence, especially talking about metaphysics. Remember, metaphysics is that branch of uh, philosophy that talks about ultimate reality and is there a higher being, is there a God, the arguments for God's existence. All these things are part of metaphysics. I took a course uh, in metaphysics back in the mid-80s when I was working on my degree in, uh, in philosophy at the University of St. Thomas. And we spent a lot of time talking about this in this traditional understanding that what this is emphasizing is God as eternal being. That's not right. That's how most of us have understood this. I don't think that's right. I'm going to show you why I don't think that's right. That's called the ontological view. Now, ontological is one of those words that a lot of people use just every day, right? Ontology is basically the same thing as metaphysics. I mean, if you break down the etymology, it refers to uh, the study of being. Ontos is the Greek participle for uh, being, for is, to be. And so it's called the ontological view. He's going to use that word. He says, what is clear is that the phrase is not ontological in nature. That is, it doesn't mean I am he who exists if it, as if God were disclosing his eternality, which is how many of us have understood this. He says, he goes on and um, analyzes it a little later, but I just wanted to read that section out of his book to introduce this to you. And then this last week, I got one of these little jewels that I pick up every now and then. Back when I started getting really hungry to study the Word and really interested in the Word, and I say this because I want young men who think they have the gift of pastor, teacher, and old men who are pastors to listen, because I find this to be rare today. There are some out there. That's one of the purposes of Chafer Seminary is to create this kind of knowledge in many pastors as to how to study. What I did, I picked up first framework pamphlet, which Charlie Clough wrote, and I read it, and I thought it was great, and he had a bibliography in the back, and so I bought every book in the bibliography, and I read every book in the bibliography. Framework 2 came out, and I did the same thing. And I would read other books, and I would notice, I would always read the footnotes. I hate endnotes. I hate in. They're better if they're at the end of the chapter, but they're just terribly inconvenient when they're at the end of the book. And I always have to have three or four bookmarks at the back so that I can get back and forth. Because many times, if they're good authors and they're doing good scholarship, they will have a footnote that's not just saying, okay, this is really... A lot of times you'll see a footnote, footnoting some commentary. What they're saying is, see, I did my due diligence. I read all the commentaries. But if it's a good book, a well-researched book, he's going to have a paragraph in the footnote. And there's better information in that footnote, but it's more technical, which is why they don't put it into the main, main text. I got a book called by David Driesbach called Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers. I don't want to read the text. I just want to read his footnotes. His footnotes are long paragraphs, and, and they're the most informative paragraphs. And I, I spend most of my time just going thumb into the back and reading the, you know, the six-point print in the footnotes. But that's what I do. And so I was reading in one book about uh, worship and about the names of God, and I noticed that a, there was a book a commentary on Exodus that was quoted frequently, and since the person I was reading is quite a respected uh, Hebrew scholar, I paid attention to that, especially his comments and quotes that were included in the footnote, and I traced it down and had to buy an extremely expensive used version because it's out of print, called the second book of the Bible, Exodus. Uh, that was written by 
probably in Hebrew, by Beno Yaakov. And then it says it's translated with an introduction by Walter Yaakov. So this was originally written in Hebrew, Jewish scholar, not a Christian scholar. And he just absolutely blew me away. He's got five or six pages just on understanding uh, the name of God and what it means. And what's significant is he makes observations that I only know of one of my Hebrew professors who under, understood this, and I didn't catch it when I had him. What is typical is this footnote that you find in the NET Bible. Remember I said that most of that represents uh, the Old Testament scholars at Dallas Seminary and a few others, so I don't know who wrote this. It says the verb form used here, and when God says, I am, that's the Hebrew form, yet, yeah. It's not Yahweh, because it's first person singular, so it's et, yeah. Yahweh is third person. He says the, it's the Cal imperfect uh, to be. It forms an excellent paranomasia with the name. That's a word play. Uh, the verb forms a paranomasia with the name of God. So when God used the verb to express his name, he used this form saying, I am. When his people refer to him as Yahweh, which is the third person masculine singular form of the same verb, they say he is. Now, some commentators argue for a future tense translation, I will be who I will be, because the verb has an active quality about it, and the Israelites lived in the light of the promises for the future. Now, they don't agree with that, but I think that's exactly what's going on in the text. They argue that I am would be of little help to the Israelites in bondage. But a translation of I will be does not effectively do much more except restrict it to the future. See, they're not thinking deeply enough. That is not, that, that ignores the context what is it that's happening? Is that they're enslaved by the Egyptians? What's God saying? I'm going to act. It's not putting it in some indefinite form of the future. It's saying after uh, almost 400 years of silence, God is saying, okay, I'm here. We're going to take care of the, I'm going to take care of the problem. And so... I'll stop there. Now, this is what this guy, Ben Ojakov, says. He says, first of all, the word hayah, that's the verb that's at the root of the name Yahweh. The verb hayah does not refer to existence or reality, nor can it be understood to refer to a being which remains unchanging. He's not denying immutability when he says that. He's saying that's not what it's talking about. He then says, rather it means, quote, to be present to be a peer, to manifest itself, and basically to be an intervening force in the world. See, now that is much more powerful a statement. God is saying, I'm going to intervene and I'm going to act. This is not something passive. It's not this twaddle that they put in the NET Bible. I've never liked it. I've never said a good thing about it. And I continue to after almost 20 years, be consistent. So, then he says, secondly, he says, this form, yeah, yeah, which is what God said in the first person, is in the future tense. So he is saying, I will be. I will act. It's a promise. He's sending Moses. Moses, you want a confirmatory message? Here's the message. I will act. I will intervene. I'm going to fulfill the promise. That's exactly what the context has been showing, If as, as I've been pointing out. God heard their groaning in 224, and God remembered his covenant uh, with Moses. And then he says this again in 3.7, uh, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And now in the midst of this, when, when Moses says, well, who do I tell tell?" Uh, sent them. Then he says in verse 15, uh, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to generations. And then in the next verse, um, 
he says, goes on to say, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you. And he, it's all about answering their prayer. And that's the whole context of everything around that surrounds and frames this statement that is translated, I am, that I am, when it should be, I will Uh, I will be what I will be, indicating that I am going to uh, now fulfill the patriarchal promises and that name will really mean something. And so the conclusion is that the ontological meaning is deeply flawed based on grammar and context. It's a future tense. It's not I am present tense. It's I will be future tense. And context, which reiterates the that he's hearing the prayer and he's going to act in fulfillment of the um, uh, of the Abrahamic covenant. Agya is first person, I am. It's future, I will be, I will act. And the meaning is that he is the God who will now act to deliver them and fulfill the patriarchal promises. In an article in Bibliotheca Sacra in the good old days, before uh, it totally went down the tubes, which was just recently. Someone named Charles Giannotti wrote an article on the meaning of the divine name Yahweh in Dallas Seminary's Theological Journal. His conclusion is that what this means is what God says he will do. His name promises that, and he will act on behalf of his people. But Yahweh does not ultimately limit the significance of his name to the children of Israel. As Eichrod succinctly states, it is in the person of Jesus that the function of the name of Yahweh as a form of the divine self-manifestation, and I would add intervention, finds its fulfillment. Truly Jesus, Giannotti writes, is the par excellence manifestation of God's active effectiveness in the history of the world. And what that means for us is the same thing. God intervenes and he acts. No matter what the situation is, what the problems are, God intervenes and God acts. Now, the other thing to say about this is that in the Hebrew, because there were no vowels originally, the name of God is spelled with four letters, Y-H-W-H. And because of the way Y's and W's are pronounced going across different languages, often a Y sound represents a J, and a V, a V represents a W. A lot of scholarship was done in German, both because you had, uh, you had Protestant Germans who learned Hebrew, but they learned it from German Jews who spoke German and they pronounced the, the, the y, y and they would transliterate it as a J because that's how you wrote Y in, in, uh, in German. And if you were writing a V, you wrote it as W. So it became written as J-H-V-H. Then in the Middle Ages, you had a couple of uh, monks who came along who really didn't know Hebrew very well because what had happened in the development of the Hebrew Bible is they, they didn't want to pronounce the name of God. They had this mystical, superstitious idea, you don't pronounce the name of God. So when you see that, you either say Hashem, the name, or you say Adonai. Now in Hebrew, in English, the vowels of Adonai are A-O-A-I. But in Hebrew, that initial A is really an E verb. So that's why they would put the vowels of Adonai in Hebrew, E, O, and A. See, there's no I. In English, we put an I there, but in Hebrew, it's actually a consonant Y. So those vowels are inserted between those letters, and you have the word Jehovah. It's not a real word. No Jew would ever know what that word meant. It was just manufactured by Christians who didn't know how to read Hebrew. And what the Jews had done is they had put the, when they ran across the consonants, they put the vowels underneath to remind the reader to read Adonai instead of saying the name Yahweh. So that's where that Jehovah came from. 
So in 314 and 315, which I've all already uh, stated, God says to Moses, I, I, I will be who I will be, and thus you will say to the children of Israel, I will be has sent me to you. And in the next verse, he emphasizes that this is because he is fulfilling the promises made to, uh, to, to Abraham. In 3.16, we read another command to go and tell the elders of Israel this, and uh, th- that what this means is, I have visited you, seen what is done to you in Egypt, and I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt. I'm going to answer your prayer. Now, let's turn over a chapter to chapter 5, skip past 4. What happens in 4 uh, is the beginning of all of the uh, conflict with, uh, and preparation for the conflict with Pharaoh. And in chapter 5, verse 1, we talk about the first encounter with Pharaoh leading up to the first plague. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh Elohim of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, you really have to spend some time thinking about this verse. At, at first, it just seems like a reasonable request. We want to go worship our God. But that is a statement of rebellion. That is a statement uh, of being a traitor. That is a statement of hostility towards, towards Pharaoh. In Egypt, Pharaoh was a god. He is the manifestation of one of the Egyptian gods. And since he is the God that is to be worshipped by all of the Egyptians, he owns all of the Egyptians. And since the time of, of uh, Joseph, he had owned all of the real estate. He owns everything. He is the, Egyptian, the manifestation of one of the Egyptian gods, and he owns all the slaves. And now his slaves are coming to him and saying they want to leave Egypt to go worship a God that isn't him. It reminds me a lot of what happens when uh, Herod the Great gets that knock on the door and these magi who are Parthian kingmakers are knocking on the door and saying, we're looking for the king of the Jews, and it's not not Herod. So here's the same kind of thing. They want to go out in the wilderness and worship uh, worship God, and it's not him. So he's taking this very personally. They're saying that God has commanded us we obey him, we don't listen to you. God is the higher authority. We might even say this is also an example of civil disobedience. It is a very strong challenge to the claim of the Egyptian state to have total authority, to define reality, to define all morality, to define uh, all reality. Everything is defined by the uh, by the Egyptian pharaoh. And what they understand is something that we don't understand anymore, is that who you worship is your ultimate authority. We have so many people today who worship themselves. They're, they are their ultimate authority. It's the problem of the time of the judges. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. They've made themselves to be the ultimate determiner of right and wrong. They've made themselves to be a god. Who you worship says who your ultimate authority is. And if the Jews are going to go out into the wilderness to worship God, they're saying, Pharaoh, you don't matter. You have nothing to say to us. Our loyalty is not to you. Our loyalty is to our God, and we are going to go and worship him. They are saying that Pharaoh is nothing. They owe him nothing. He's not their God. He's not their king. He's not, basically, they're saying, you're not the boss of me. We're going to go out in the wilderness. So this is why down through history, we see this clash between Christians and Jews with totalitarian governments. Because whenever you have a totalitarian government, whenever you have a state where religion, and in the Middle Ages you had Christianity merge with the state, claiming total power and authority over its citizens, 
when the refer when when Jews were along, Jews were not going to allow the king to have that level of exclusive authority. They were going to worship their God. When the Reformation occurred and Christianity was still united with the state, for a Christian to get baptized a second time, we talked about this in the last couple of weeks, the Anabaptists, I think it was maybe last Thursday night or the Thursday before, that this was viewed as an act of treason. They were being a traitor because the ultimate authority uh, over the church was the state and the religion the, the religion and the state was combined together and so when you are going to worship god and set god over the state and declare that the rules of the state are subservient to the authority of god then you're viewed as an enemy of the state and that's where we're headed in western civilization so this is what Daniel faced. Daniel isn't going to ru <coughs> rub their nose in it. He's not going to poke them in the eye with it. But when uh, Darius says, signs the order that you, no one can pray or ask anybody anything unless they ask me, uh, Daniel doesn't say, well, I'm going to go pray. I don't care what you say. He just goes home very quietly and do goes about what he does every single day. And that is to pray to God. And he sh his actions are saying, I have a higher authority, and it's not Darius. And as a result, he faced consequences, and God delivered him. Now remember, Daniel is always pictured as being rather young. Daniel, this happens about 537, 538 B.C. Daniel had been taken as a captive in 605. That's, you know, 67 years. Daniel was probably 15 years old or so when he's taken captive, and 15 and 67 is 82. So he's, he's not a young man anymore, and he just calmly handles the situation. So... This is, a, this is a circumstance. And Pharaoh says to him, Well, who's the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. He just is as demeaning as he can be toward God. And so they respond. They say, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. What this sets up is that the worship of God is going to set itself over against the authorities of the state. The worship of God principle you've probably never heard before is that the worship of God exhibits your greatest authority in life. When we worship God, we're worshiping, we're making a statement that God is the highest authority in our life. Okay, next time we're going to come back to a to the key one of the key passages in Exodus on worship and that's in Exodus chapter 19, and we'll look at this section from 19 to 24 when the nation, corporate nation, comes face to face with God at Mount Sinai. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be reminded that you are the God who acts and who intervenes in our lives. You are the God who delivers us from all of the uh, pressures and all of the hostility, all of the uh, horrible things that take place in our lives that we have to go through living in this corrupt world and that we need to learn to walk with you and to relax to let you handle things in your time as the Israelites did and that we need to rest in you and father we pray that you challenge us with what we've learned today that the importance of worshiping you is centered upon the fact that you are the sovereign God who controls the affairs of men and that we are to rest in your uh wisdom as to when to act, and your power as to how to act. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.